Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. It's April again, so we're back with another special in honor of National Poetry Month. Today, you'll see three mini readings by recent guests. The first is by poet and music critic Lloyd Schwartz, who had wonderful things to say about listening and about letting people's views and experiences shape his writing. Lloyd is one of the best readers I've ever heard, so I know you will enjoy his poems. A true poem. Mm -mm. I'm working on a poem that's so true I can't show it to anyone. I could never show it to anyone because it says exactly what I think and what I think scares me. Sometimes it pleases me Usually it brings misery, and this poem says exactly what I think. What I think of myself, what I think of my friends, what I think about my lover, exactly. Parts of it might please them, some of it might scare them, some of it might bring misery. And I don't want to hurt them, I don't want to hurt them, I don't want to hurt anybody. I want everyone to love me. Still, I keep working on it. Why? Why do I keep working on it? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever see it. I keep working on it even though I can never show it to anybody. I keep working on it even though someone might get hurt. This poem is a dialogue between me and my mother. And my mother was already beginning to lose her memory, but every now and then she would remember something very vividly. And this is a conversation about that. He tells his mother what he's working on. I'm writing a poem about you. You are? What's it about? It's the story about your childhood, the horses in the river. The ones that nearly drowned? I saved them. You told it to me just a few weeks ago. I should dig up more of my memories. I wish you would. Like when I lived on the farm and one of the girls fell down the well? Yes. I forget if it was Rose or Pauline. It was a deep well. I remember that story. Have you finished your poem? I'm still working on it. You mean you're correcting it with commas and semicolons? Exactly. When can I see it? As soon as it's finished. Is it an epic? It's not that long. No, I mean all my thoughts, the flashes of what's going through my life, the whole family history, living through the woe, the river and the water. I know. Will it be published? I have to finish it first. It's better to write about real life. That's more important than writing something fanciful. I try to write all my poems about real life. You see, the apple never falls far from the tree. I guess not. You're my apple. There's probably a worm crawling through that apple. Then it's got something sweet to chew on. Well, you're my tree. Yes, I'm your tree. You're an apple. I'm a tree. And this is a very short sestina. Six words. Yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, never. Never? Yes. Always? No. 
Sometimes. Maybe, maybe never sometimes. Yes, no always, always maybe. No, never yes. Sometimes, sometimes always yes. Maybe never. No, no, sometimes never. Always, maybe, yes. Yes, no, maybe, sometimes, always, never. This is called Nostalgia, the Lake at Night. The black water, lights dotting the entire perimeter, their shaky reflections, the dark tree line, the plap plapping of water around the pier, creaking boats, the creaking pier. Voices in conversation, in discussion, two men, adults, serious inflections, the words themselves just out of reach. A rusty screen door spring, then the door swinging shut. Footsteps on a porch, the scrape of a wooden chair. Footsteps shuffling through sand animated youthful voices, how many, distinct, disappearing. A sudden guffaw, some giggles, a woman's, no, a young girl's sarcastic reply, someone's assertion, a high-pitched male cackle. Somewhere else, a child laughing, bug zappers, tires whirring along a pavement, not stopping, receding. Shadows from passing headlights, a cat's eyes caught in a headlight. No moon, connect the dot constellations filling the black sky, the ladle of the Big Dipper not quite directly overhead. The radio tower across the lake signaling, muffled quacking near the shore, a frog belching, crickets, cicadas, katydids, etc., their relentless sexual messages, a sudden gust of wind, branches brushing against each other, pine, beach, a fiberglass hull tapping against the dock, a sudden chill, the smell of smoke, wood stove fires, a light going out, a dog barking, then more barking from another part of the lake, a burst of quiet laughter, someone in the distance calling someone too loud, steps on a creaking porch, a screen door spring, the door banging shut, another light going out. You must have just undressed for bed. My feet on the splintery pier, turning away from the water. When Martha Collins appeared a few weeks ago, we discussed her two new collections, Black Stars, a book of translations, and Day Unto Day, a series of short lyric poems. In this next segment, she will share a moving translation that reflects the fragility of life in our broken, beautiful world. She will also read several segments that veer, as she says, into love poem territory. Both journeys are memorable. I'm going to be reading from two books, both of them recent. One is a book of co-translations, which I did with the author, of poems from the Vietnamese. The author is Nhau Tu Lap. The book is called Black Stars. Lap was born in Hanoi in 1962, and after a great deal of travel, he lives in Hanoi, where he teaches, writes, and translates poems from English, French, and Russian. Six billion minus one equals six billion. 
Perhaps a star just died and I didn't know. Perhaps the moonlight stirred and I didn't know. And I don't know if there's anyone except for a woman, some children, who knows, as I know, that a man just passed away during the night. It's a pity we never met, but we can't be sad. The name, never important, is meaningless now. Maybe you lived as I do, in an apartment with a balcony, in a certain blue building with yellow stains, in a city beside a lake or a red river, where the children are thin and pale, their eyes like fireflies whirring toward distant bamboo. Perhaps you had a flower pot on your balcony, as I do, with earth star flowers. Perhaps you watered your plant with a rusted tin cup, waiting for its buds of joy to open. The flower fragrance that made you secretly smile and sing the songs you've taken with you is now caressing your feet, which have grown cold and wet with the flowing tears of your good wife. On your shelf I find my own books, the complete works of Plato, Xeroxed and bound with Chinese staples, the tale of Q printed in 1962, the Holy Bible bought in a secondhand bookshop, and your own works printed on cheap paper with loose covers. It's a pity we never met, but we can't be sad. Plato died, Jesus and Nguyen Zhu died, now it's your turn. Someone said that death makes us all equal. I'd like to add, death makes us all contemporaries. Can anyone offer a better farewell than that? And now I will turn to my own poems. I'm going to read a long poem, one of six poems, in a new book called Day Unto Day. Each of these six poems is made up of 30 or 31 short sections. Each was written over the course of a month at the rate of one poem per day. This is the third sequence. It was written in April 2006. A couple of things I should mention. Um, I realized at some point that the first three words of my first poem were also the first three words of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, and they're the first three words of this poem. The second thing is that my husband had just come home from major surgery and was recovering, and the sections of this poem that I will read are pretty much in love poem territory. Under Green, April 2006. One. April is the First poem too young for cruelest time I wrote, when flowers wrote, rainbows wrote, birds. Too young for memory then, and now is only just today my love is well come home. Two. First daffodils for Scythia flash the old gray world with grade school yellow. Scylla grounds it blue, one tulips red with yellow, pistol stamens still the same. Three. Down the street from the green school where lines form, the red school waits. My love checks his blood now, wet rubies on his fingers. Love lives on what is lost, draws blood, colors us in. Four. Hawk got dove today, sharp-shinned hawk, morning dove. Beside the garden pulls feathers plucked down, pecked at entrails wet with blood, eight flew low with what was left, bird heavy with bird. Five. 
Sudden snow dusts ground, maples red with early flowers. Snow turned rain will bring them down, wash blood from broken bodies, push up and out green, out hidden leaves. Six. Tulip closed against the cold, snow bent it down, made a smooth white egg of it. Its own heat broke it open, red. Seven. With him, my love, better now each day break, but days do not begin and break, have never been break, so much with any one break, since I break, I hold, will not break. Eight. Fifteen years, thousands of days, millions of minutes passed since that April day when I, my own one, as long as we both live, love, said yes. Yes, I do. We round out this month's show with a reading by Gary Whited, a poet, philosopher, and psychotherapist who will be our guest next month on Poetic Lines. Gary's writing, like Lloyd's, deals with listening. But Gary listens to the prairie where he grew up. His work captures the flavor and the visuals of that environment, and he makes readers think more deeply about their own sense of belonging. So I'm going to read a few poems from the place where I grew up, namely the prairie, the prairie of eastern Montana. These are poems that are included in my book called Having Listened. The prairie is where I learned to listen. So this is a poem to prairie, by that name, prairie. And it's a poem that comes from listening to the visuals of the prairie. So here it is, prairie. Wind sweeps across this picture. Meadowlark on barbed wire, yellow-breasted door opens with its song. Weathered fence posts hold the wire. Below the ground, they slowly rot. Wind almost every place in this picture. Shirts on the clothesline, their sleeves ripple. The rattlesnake suns her long body on the scoria outcropping. Her skin flutters above her like worn flags. Magpie flickers through chokecherry bushes at the edge of the creek. The black fruit sweetens in the long light. Beneath the wind, do not forget the badger who digs alone into the sod and the silence. While high above, wind carries the rough-legged hawk on her long hunt over wheat fields that move in waves across the field, each stalk tossing its head like water. And as far as I can see, the shadow of anything standing ripens twice each day. So that's the flavor of the place. Let me give you the flavor of the people of that place. I'll start with my father. This poem is called My Father's Trips to Town. What a shy gentleman he was, in the field, working, in the church, silent, unwilling to sing, and in the bank, head bowed, bargaining with only the promise of harvest. Yet in the bar, loosened by liquor, laughing, dice-shaking, dare-taking beyond his reach. At last, returning home after dark, he walked alone, scolded to the barn, to milk the burdened cow who lashed him in his shame with her piss-wet tail, as he sat cursing on the three-legged milking stool. So I'll, I'll get the rest of the family that I grew up with into the picture in this poem called Farm. 
My mother stood at her kitchen window, facing north and wringing her hands, heavy like iron, that I thought I could unwind her gnarl of worry. When my father fixed fence along the creek, he expected supper. She unwound her worried hands to make it, a mix of potatoes, meat, and sorrow. My father ate everything except the sorrow. My brother and I divided it. He, being older, took the smaller share. Evening came. I walked to the barn to gather the cows, to smell the water in the cattle tank, to imagine I was a fin on the windmill, a splinter on the fence post holding the gate. So another poem that uh, borrows images from the prairie, but is a whole different tone or genre, uh, sort of a jazzy poem, I suppose. I call it Eden. Blue wind shaped the first guitar, made it ocean, made it swimming tigers, made it shine light to that face only my hands could find made it yellow the edges of old albums, made it cosmos, made it chicken house, windmill, and water tank holding, made me long for the sea, dive deep, my eyes find bright coral glowing, made grass blow under the east wind, brought sound spilling from every tongue over lips full kissed, when God touched the tree, touched me, touched you, carved words, touched our hips to dance, spun our blood into new marrow, called it love, called it mud, hawk, turtle, called it here, called you mine, called me yours, called everything, until calling stuttered our lips to silence, to kiss, to lie still, to hold tight, to let this go. Hmm. So, um, I'll actually uh, give you a poem not from the prairie. Uh, this poem is very recent in response to all the ice and the snow that we have been visited upon by. Um, I wrote this poem very quickly the other day as I looked out my window at the houses around me. It's called Ice Dams. Ice caresses the sides of houses up and down my street, hugging shingles, touching each of their ripples and gaps. What does the ice say to the shingles, I wonder? It's our time. I won't be here for long. The sun will entice me away from you. Little rivers stream down the ice, adding passion and length at the tip, stalactiting down the wall, off the gutters, reaching. Even in the night, the ice drips its reach further, its passion refusing to stop for the temperatures drop into the dark, stealing from the heat the house gives off to keep lust streaming down and down and down into any crevice of roof, shingle, or window. Why would you stop if you began as a snowflake falling from up there and found warmth at the roof edge of a lovely house well lit inside, offering a place to transform yourself from crystal to liquid? pouring your body into the loveliness of warmth you have not found until now. So let me give you one more poem back on the prairie, a poem that comes from the experience that every prairie boy has of initiation. When it comes time to help a cow give birth who's struggling, we thought of it as midwifing the cows. This poem is called, It Goes On. It's kind of a poem of initiation. It goes on. 
This time, I'm 14, and he says, it's your turn. When the next contraction hits, her body groans. A sound, someplace between pain and pleasure, passes between my own ribs. One foot appears, not two. Naked to the shoulder, between contractions, I reach in. Blind hand finds what I've already seen, only one front foot. I reach deeper, fingers swimming upstream, as if entering a dream. The cow seems miraculously not bothered by my presence inside her. Then it comes, next wave of her push. She grips my arm with her birth canal, nothing more sure of itself. Her moan cleaves the air. I lie with her, smell of winter straw, manure, dirt, and wet cow's tail so close there is no room to doubt this world. And inside her dark, the other leg touches my farthest finger, which cannot move until she stops. The moment she relaxes, I reach deeper, grab the folded knee, and with my feet braced against the ground, push the small body back where there's more room, all the way to where I find the backward foot, grip its slippery hoof, flip it forward to join the other, lace my fingers around the hawks, tighten my grip, and wait. When it comes, I pull, pull with her push, my arm as intimate with her as strange to itself. Little one sliding into sight, two front feet, legs, pink nose, white face, ears slicked back, the long red body, all of it sliding onto the exhausted straw. I hope you've enjoyed this April special. Tune in next month for more Poetic Lines.